Our topic for this evening, as you saw, is Ellen White and the Trinity. Now, if any of you have known me before, have watched some of my messages, um, almost 99% of my messages are Bible and Bible only. Because I come from a non-Adventist background, I did not grow up as an Adventist, and the Bible to me is everything. Amen. If it's not in the Bible, don't bother sharing it with me. I will not accept it. Doesn't matter who said it. It has to be in the Bible, right? Amen? Okay, all right. So all my messages are from the Bible. Uh, this topic on the Godhead and the Trinity, I've covered in many of my messages purely from the Bible. I've written a book about it purely, purely from the Bible. I'll bring a few copies. I only have 50 copies of that book, probably on Sabbath. But uh, along the years, and especially of recent time, uh, I've spoken to some Seventh-day Adventists, and they said over and over again that Ellen White taught the Trinity. Ellen White changed the church. The desire of ages turned the ship around. How many of you have heard of this? Okay, most of you have. Well, I, I, I heard them, and I thought, all right, well, it's been a couple of years since I did a presentation purely about Adventist writings. Maybe it's time I do another one. I've done one two years ago and haven't done any since, so I thought I'll do another one just to sort of answer these questions. Amen? So if you're here, if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, please bear with me. Uh, tomorrow, all of the speakers, and tomorrow uh, I'll be just dealing Bible only. There's a lot of material out there that is Bible only, but if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you will understand why I am doing this presentation. I hope it will make sense to you. Before we start, if you're able, please bow your head with me so we begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus and for all what we have in him. Without him, we are nothing. Father, as we are uh, about to examine now the writings of uh, what we believe is your prophet, Ellen White, uh, on this most important topic about your identity, the identity of your son and your spirit, I pray, dear Lord, that you will uh, enlighten us that you speak to your people, dear Lord, that you'll use this message for your glory, for those who, uh, who believe uh, on your prophet, dear Lord, I pray that this message will speak to them. May everything that will be done and said in here be to your glory and the glory of your son, Jesus, is my prayer in his precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So, as I said... Uh, I have dealt with this topic. Many of the speakers in here have dealt with this topic, written a lot of materials from the Bible. But where does Ellen White fit in the picture? Where does Ellen White fit in regards to the Trinity? Was she a Trinitarian? Did she teach a Trinity? Was she a non-Trinitarian and later on became a Trinitarian? Well, let us examine some of the writings. I'd like to begin with a statement from a past pastor in Australia by the name of Max Hatton. The reference is down here of his website, as you can see, and this is taking a portion from his article, and he is one of the very, very, very few that would actually come out and would admit that. And he said, as I have already said, <clears throat> I conclude that Ellen White was a semi-Aryan in her early years in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Her statements that I have offered cannot be reconciled with the Trinity doctrine. Prior to this statement, he shared some of Ellen White's statements to prove that she was not a Trinitarian. And he's saying, the statements I shared cannot be harmonized with the Trinity. He goes on to say, thankfully she did grow in understanding and consequently changed her stand as she gained a, as she gained a clearer picture of what God is. She unquestionably became a Trinitarian and made many positive statements declaring this fact to be so. Now we will examine some of these statements that she has made. But now, I'm not just calling anybody in here. Uh, when we had a problem with this issue of the Trinity, and probably, I don't know, 10 years ago, we had a meeting with the conference in Sydney. I was living in Sydney at, the, at that time. The conference chose this pastor to come and sit in the meeting to sort of uh, um, share his understanding of the Trinity. He used to be considered one of the sort of authorities on the Trinity doctrine in the Sydney conference. He has written two books on the Trinity. So it's not just anybody I'm quoting, right? Because anybody can say anything. He's supposed to be, he knows what he's talking about. Now, not many Seventh-day Adventist pastors or historians would agree with what Master, uh, Pastor Max Hatton said. Uh, others would have different 
opinions about whether Alan Watt was a semi-Aryan, as he said, or not. However, most, if not all, historians would admit that the Adventist church was a non-Trinitarian church prior to the Desire of Ages. Let's have a look at a few statements. This is taken from Merlin Burt, and he said, up until the turn of the 20th century, Seventh-day Adventist literature was almost without exception opposed to the eternal deity of Jesus and anti-Trinitarian. Now, allow me to highlight a couple of things from here. Number one, he's saying up till the turn of the century, that means up till 1900, which later on we'll find out he means by the 1898 when the Desire of Ages was published. <coughs> but nonetheless, he says up till that time, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist literature was almost without exception opposed to the eternal deity of Jesus. That is wrong. And you will see evidence for that. This is his understanding of the non-Trinitarian view. He believed that if you do not believe in uh, the Trinity, in God the Son, that means you're opposing the eternal deity of Jesus. Now, we will see more evidence on that. But at least he admitted that up till the 1900, the Seventh-day Adventist church was non-Trinitarian, right? Notice from the book, The Trinity, what we read. Those Seventh-day Adventists who rejected the traditional Trinity doctrine of the Christian creed had no question about the biblical testimony regarding the, etern the eternity of God the Father, the deity of Jesus Christ as creator, redeemer, and mediator, and the importance of the Holy Spirit. So there you go. That's from a theologian, historian. He admits that those Seventh-day Adventists who rejected the Trinity doctrine, they had no problem with the eternal deity of Jesus Christ. Yes? But again, he admits that they were non-Trinitarian. So you have <laughs> pastors, theologians, historians that will publicly admit that the Seventh-day Adventist church early in the peace, just before the turn of the century, was non-Trinitarian. I, I, want, I want you to keep it in mind. William Johnson, I'm sure you're familiar with this statement. He said many of the pioneers, including James White, Jan Andrews, Uriah Smith, and J.H. Wagner, held to an Aryan or semi-Aryan view. That is, the Son at some point in time before the creation of our world was generated by the Father. So he's telling you these people, the founders of the Advent movement, they believed that at some point in the eternity past, God the Father generated, or as the Bible says, brought forth a son. <coughs> All right. Notice what he goes on to say. Only gradually did this false doctrine, what false doctrine? The non-Trinitarian, the semi-Aryan, the doctrine that Jesus at some point in time in eternity past was brought forth by the Father. He's saying this false doctrine only gradually did it give way to the biblical truth and largely under the impact of Ellen White's writings in statements such as, in Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. We will deal with this statement later on. But he calls what they believed false doctrine, and he says, when Ellen White published The Desire of Ages, this is taken from The Desire of Ages, sort of she started turning the ship around. She started steering their belief towards the Trinity. Yes? You follow me? Notice also what we read in the book Issues. The Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia attributes Adventism's gradual adoption of Trinitarianism to the influence of Ellen White's writings, especially key statements found in the Desire of Ages, published in 1898. Again, over and over we see that they are admitting that the Adventist church was non-Trinitarian, but in 1898, when Ellen White published the Desire of Ages, that started turning the ship around. You can see that? <coughs> All right, another one taken from Jerry Moon. He says, nevertheless, the publication of Ellen White's Desire of Ages in 1898 became the continental divide for the Adventist understanding of the Trinity. So it all boils down to the Desire of Ages. In Desire of Ages, Ellen White turned the ship around. Prior to that, the Adventist movement was non-Trinitarian. After that, the Adventist movement became Trinitarian. Just like that. We'll see about that. But the common theme is that through the book, Desire of Ages, Ellen White changed the belief of the church. So what we're going to do today is compare Ellen White's writings, not all of them, don't worry, 
we will finish tonight. <coughs> Relating to this topic, what you said before desire of ages and after desire of ages, is that fair? Right? Because if in desire of ages she turned the ship around, then surely what she said before desire of ages on this topic will be different than what she said after desire of ages, right? It's only common sense. So we'll do that. But before we do that, allow me to highlight something of what Ellen White said. Notice what she wrote in 1906, that's eight years after desire of ages. She said, and now after half a century, after 50 years, of clear light from the word as to what is truth, there are rising many false theories to unsettle minds. But the evidence given in our early experience has the same force that it had then. The truth is the same as it ever has been, and not a pin or a pillar can be moved from the structure of truth. That which was sought for out of the word in 1844, 45, and 46 remains the truth today in every particular. So eight years after the Zahra of Ages, she's telling you what we've believed for the past 50 years is still true today. And there are some people who are trying to change that. Was the personality of Christ one of those things that they believe? Let, let, let her answer. <coughs> Notice what she said in 1905. Those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. Those who try to bring in theories that would remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God or of Christ are working as blind men. They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. So was the personality of Christ and the personality of God a foundation, a pillar of what they believed early? That's what she just said. It's the old landmarks. I mean, just from that alone, that, that should tell you that the conclusion that these historians, theologians, and pastors reach to cannot be true. Because after this hour of ages, she's telling you what we believed about the personality of Christ is a platform. These old landmarks, back in the 44, 45, 46, it's still true today. And those who are trying to change it, change it are going to set the ship or the church adrift without an anchor. They're destroying the pillars. I mean, that alone is enough. <coughs> but some people will say, well, no, 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 no. Ellen White believed differently what the pioneers believed about the pre-existence of Christ. Well, let's see. Notice what we read here in her writings. She says, for instance, an effort was made to obtain the use of the hall at a village four miles from Hastings, where some of our workers proposed to present the gospel to the people. But they did not succeed in obtaining the hall because a school teacher there opposed the truth and declared to the people that Seventh-day Adventists did not believe in the divinity of Christ. This man may not have known what our faith is on this point, but he was not left in ignorance. I'll keep reading, but pause for a second. <coughs> Why do you think this man thought or believed that Adventists do not believe in the divinity of Jesus? Because the Adventist church was not reinterred, as all the historians would admit, right? Now, notice how they set him straight. That's Ellen White talking. She says, he was informed that there is not a people on earth who hold more firmly to the truth of Christ's pre-existence than do Seventh-day Adventists. But the answer was given that they did not want that the doctrines of Seventh-day Adventists should be promulgated in that community and so forth. So when Ellen Watt was talking in here, was she talking about herself included in the church? Yes. She believed the same as the church on the pre-existence of Christ. So even though most theologians and historians do not want to admit that Ellen Watt was a non-Trinitarian prior to DA, just give them that for now, whether they like it or not, by saying that the Adventist church was non-Trinitarian, they are saying that the prophet of that church was non-Trinitarian. And she agrees with them. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, what, what that guy historian said about this false doctrine regarding that the son was brought forth of the father in the days of eternity, that false doctrine was believed by Ellen White. Ellen White believed it as well. Right? <coughs> She's included in it. 
I guess what Jerry Moon wrote sums up our dilemma very well. He said that most of the leading Seventh-day Adventist pioneers and non-Trinitarians in their theology has become accepted Adventist history, surprising as it sounded to most Adventists 40 years ago when Erwin Gain wrote an MA thesis on the topic. More recently, a further question has arisen with increasing urgency. Was the pioneer's belief about the Godhead right or wrong? As one line of reasoning goes, either the pioneers were wrong and the present church is right, or the pioneers were right and the present Seventh-day Adventist church has apostatized from biblical truth. I guess he sums up the whole dilemma very nicely in one paragraph. Either the whole, all these founders of the Adventist church, including Ellen White, were wrong, and now the church has received light from heaven, or they were right, and we have, or the church has went the wrong way. <coughs> That's what he's saying. So let's begin comparing Ellen White's writings before and after these art of ages. Who is God? In 1879, she said, after the earth was created and the beast upon it, the father and the son carried out their purposes. And now God says to his son, let us make man in our image. That's in 1879. So who is God? The father. God said his son, to his son, the father said to his son, let us make man in our image, right? Notice what she said in 1904. God is the father of Christ. Christ is the Son of God. To Christ has been given an exalted position. He has been made equal with the Father. All the counsels of God are open to His Son. That's in 1904. That is six years after the Desire of Ages. Who is God? Is the Father of Christ. And just in case you don't get it, Christ is the Son of God. Did she change her belief? In 1906, I love God. I love Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I feel an intense interest and so forth. Who is God? Who is Jesus Christ? The Son of God. That's what she's saying, right? I'm just reading statements. She said before, these are of ages and after these are of ages, same belief. Jesus was the Son of God in heaven. Notice what she said in 1870. Angels, were, angels that were loyal and true sought to reconcile this mighty rebellious angel to the will of his creator. They clearly set forth that Jesus was the Son of God existing with him before the angels were created and that he had ever stood at the right hand of God. These are the, the rebellious angels in heaven. They went to the, sorry, the loyal angels in heaven. They went to the rebellious angels and they said, hey, this, this, this Jesus that you're rebelling against, he's the Son of God existing with him before we were created. This is way before the incarnation, right? This was in 1870. Notice what she said in 1910. Angels were expelled from heaven because they would not work in harmony with God. This fact, the angels would obscure. What fact? That Christ was the only begotten Son of God, and they came to consider that they were not to consult Christ. One angel began the controversy and so forth. That's in 1910. That is 12 years after the Tsar of Ages. She's still telling you that the war in heaven was over, the, or rather the loyal angels in heaven were telling the rebellious angels, this Jesus is the Son of God. It is a fact. Way before the incarnation. Proverbs 8, she applied it to Jesus in 1890. She said, And the Son of God declares concerning himself, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his works, before his works of old I was set up, and so forth. Right? That's in 1890. Now, I'm assuming you've all studied, most of you studied Proverbs 8, and you know what it's saying, right? Jesus is speaking there under the title of wisdom, and he's saying, the Lord, I was, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways. I was set up or anointed before his works of old. I was brought forth. Possessed and brought forth means born. Set up means anointed, right? I have another message on it, but, but Jesus was born and was anointed in heaven. That's what Proverbs 8 does. As a matter of fact, <coughs> Ellen White uh, agrees with that. Listen to what she says five years later after that statement. A complete offering has been made for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not a son by creation, as were the angels, nor a son by adoption, 
as is the forgiven sinner, but a son begotten in the express image of the Father's person and in all his brightness, all the brightness of his majesty and glory, one equal with God in authority, dignity, and divine perfection. In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I want you to reason a bit. I want you to think of it. She says he was begotten in all the brightness of his majesty and glory. When Jesus was born on earth, was he born in all the glory of God? Do you think sinners will be able to withstand, look at the glory of God? All his majesty and glory? With the brightness of all his majesty? Do you think man will withstand if God is to come and reveal his glory and brightness? Would we live? But she's saying he was begotten in that. When was he begotten in that? In heaven. In heaven. That's what she believed. That's what the Bible says. Right? The Bible said it before she was born, right? <laughs> but however, notice what she said after the desire of ages, 1906. The Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, existed from eternity, a distinct person, yet one with the Father. He was the, the surpassing glory of heaven. He was the commander of the heavenly intelligences. And the adoring homage of the angels was received by him as his right. This was no robbery of God. And she quotes now, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways. End of quote. He declares. Who is he? Christ, Jesus. Then she goes on quoting, Before his works of old, and so forth. So she applied Proverbs 8, which says that Jesus was begotten in the days of eternity. She said that before these are of ages, and after these are of ages. This is in 1906. Did she change her belief that Jesus was the Son of God in heaven? No. Well, the son been given an exalted position. She said this one in 1879. She says, The great creator assembled the heavenly host that he might, in the presence of all the angels, confer special honor upon his son. The son was seated on the throne with the father. And the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ should be equal with himself. So that wherever was the presence of his son, it was his own presence. His word was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the Father. His son, he had invested with authority to command the heavenly host. So the father invested his son with authority. Authority and, and, and power was given to his son. She said that in 1879. Notice what she said in 1904, after these out of ages. God is the father of Christ. Christ is the son of God. To Christ has been given an exalted position. He has been made equal with the father. Did she change her belief that Christ was given an exalted position? No. <laughs> what about the Council of Peace between two beings? 1897, before the Zara of Ages, she said, In the plan to save a lost world, the council was between them both. The covenant of peace was between the Father and the Son. In the Zara of Ages, she says, Before the foundation of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in the covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. They had clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ should become the surety for the human race. She's saying the same thing in these out of ages. And after these out of ages, in 1902, she says, By Christ, the work upon which the fulfillment of God's purpose rests was accomplished. This was the agreement in the councils of the Godhead. The Father purposed in council with His Son that the human family should be tested and proved. Did she change her belief? Okay, what about Christ being the only being? In 1890, she said, Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the eternal Father, one in nature, in character, in purpose. The only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. She said that in 1890. Notice what she said the year just before this out of ages. Christ, that is, the only being who was one with God, lived the law in humanity. He's the only being that was one with God. Notice what she said in the great controversy that was published in 88 and in 1911. That is 13 years after the Tsar of Ages. She says, Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the eternal Father, one in nature, in character, and in purpose. The only being in all the universe that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. By Christ, the Father wrote in the creation of all heavenly beings. Even after this hour of age, she's, she's still saying he's the only being that could enter. What about worship? 
1870, she says, Adam and Eve united with them, that's the angel, and raised their voices in harmonious songs of love, praise, and adoration to the Father and His dear Son for the tokens of love which surrounded them. Two beings were worshipped, the Father and His Son. Notice what she said in 1898, the year Desire of Ages was published. The Father and the Son alone are to be exalted. There's no third being to be exalted. The Father and the Son alone. And in 1903, after these are wages, she said, In your hands will be placed a golden harp, and touching its strings, you will join with the redeemed host in filling all heaven with songs of praise to God and His Son. This is how you test if a prophet is a genuine or false prophet. If the prophet is in harmony with the Bible, and the Bible says, Truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son. That's First John. She's in harmony with the Bible, so we accept her writing. If she's out of harmony with the, with the Bible, you throw her writings out, right? That's what you should do if you're the people of the book. You test whoever speaks by the Word of God, which is found in the Scriptures. She is in harmony. Now, what about the Holy Spirit? <laughs> she says the Holy Spirit is Christ Himself. She says in 94, 1894, we want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ. In 95, she said, Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them, go to his Father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. The Holy Spirit is himself divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. And in 1906, eight years after the Zahar Vajish, she said, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Christ is not here referring to his doctrine, but to his person, the divinity of his character. So who is the Holy Spirit? It is his person. It is himself. She said that before and after the Zahar of Ages. The Holy Spirit is the life of Christ, she said. In 97, she says, the influence of the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ in the soul. We do not now see Christ and speak to him, but his Holy Spirit is just as near us in one place as another. It works in, in and through everyone who receives Christ. So who do we receive? Christ. It is His Spirit. In 98, <coughs> the Zara of Ages, that is, she said, the impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. Is the life of Christ a different person than Christ? Again, in Desire of Ages, page 827, she says, Christ gives them the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. In 1904, she says, This comforter is the Holy Spirit, the soul of his life. And in 1911, she said, Christ gives them the life of his life. Can you see any change in theology? All right. She says, It's the spirit of Christ. She says, but it is the leaven of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, which is sent down from heaven, called the Holy Ghost, in 91. So the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, is the Spirit of Christ, or the life of Christ. In 95, she said the same thing. She says, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. It is His representative. Here is the divine agency that carries conviction to the heart. And in 1909, that is 11 years after the Tsar of Ages, let them be thankful to God for His manifold mercies and be kind to one another. They have one God and one Savior and one Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is to bring them, to bring unity into their ranks. So up till 1909, she's still saying the same thing. What about the presence of Christ? 92, she says, the Holy Spirit is the comforter as the personal presence of Christ to the soul. It is His presence. In the Zara of Ages, she says, the Savior has not promised his followers the luxury, luxuries of the world. He has promised that which is far better than worldly good, the abiding comfort of his own presence. And in 1911, the great controversy again, she says, Jesus led them, that's the disciples, out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands in blessing, bade them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, adding, lo, I... I am with you always. When on the day of Pentecost, the promised comforter descended and the power from on high was given and the souls of the believers thrilled 
with the conscience presence of their ascended Lord. It is himself. It is he himself. <coughs> it is his presence. Again, she said, Jesus is our comforter. In 92, she said, the Savior is our comforter. This I have proved him to be. In 98, she says, Christ comes as a comforter to all who believe. In 1902, she says, Christ is to be known by the blessed name of comforter. In 1904, she says, Christ declared that after he, his ascension, he would send to his church as his crowning gift the comforter who was to take his place. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit, the soul of his life, and goes on. So, so far we have seen, I've rushed because I wanted to cover it all. So far we have seen that before and after these other ages, she said, God is the Father of Christ. She said, Jesus was the Son of God in heaven. She applied Proverbs 8 to Jesus, meaning that he is begotten in heaven. She said that he's the Son, that the Son has been given an exalted position that the council of peace was between two beings, that the Son is the only being that is one with God and could enter the councils of God. She said that worship is given to the Father and the Son alone. She said the Holy Spirit is Christ himself. The Holy Spirit is the life of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the presence of Christ. Jesus is our comforter. So all these things, she had the same belief before these out of ages and after these out of ages. What in the world did she change? Are you following me? Yeah. I just wanted to be a bit reasonable, logical. But because Ellen White said few statements that seemed to be teaching the Trinity, suddenly she became a Trinitarian. For example, in these out of ages, Ellen White said, uh, uh, mentioned about the... <laughs> third person of the Godhead. Have anybody heard this statement? Now suddenly that statement is taken out of a thick book, that thick. It took me so long to read it. Just one statement is taken out of it and she's a Trinitarian. What about what she said elsewhere in the same book? If you want to understand what she wrote, you need to follow the rules that she said. She said, the testimonies themselves will be the key that will explain the messages given as scripture is explained by scripture. If you want to understand the testimonies, look at the testimonies. See what she said elsewhere. See what she understood. And she said also, regarding the testimonies, nothing is ignored, nothing is cast aside, but time and place must be considered. Consider the time and place. Consider what was happening at that time. Consider what was going on, what was being taught. Right? Then you understand. Now, what did she mean by the third person of the Godhead? Here is the statement. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. That statement is cut paste. Somewhere else, there you go. Trinity. Keep reading. Just keep reading the same paragraph. Let's keep reading. Notice what it says. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It is by the spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hered hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to place his own character upon his church. So who is the third person of the Godhead? It is his spirit. That's what she said. Just keep reading the next sentence. Isn't this what we just saw earlier? That's what she said before the Tsar of Ages. That's what she said after the Tsar of Ages. So what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Oh, she called it third person of the Godhead. Compare this one, third person of the Godhead, with this statement, what she said earlier. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. It is His representative. Here is the divine agency. We read this before the Tsar of Ages, right? 95. In the Tsar of Ages, she said, the third person of the Godhead, Christ has given His Spirit as a divine power. So, Holy Spirit, she called it third person of the Godhead. She said in the first statement, it's the Spirit of Christ. In the second statement, she said, it is His Spirit. In the first statement, she said, it's a divine agency. In the second statement, she said, it's a divine power. What's the difference? Why suddenly this statement becomes a Trinitarian and this one isn't? Can you see? She's saying the same thing. Just put a different terminology. It's a third person. But she told you who the third person is. 
However, let us see who else she said, what else she said about the Holy Spirit in the book, These Are of Ages. On page 21, she said, All things Christ received from God, but he took to give. So in the heavenly course in his ministry for all created being, beings, through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all. Through the Son, it returns in praise and joy, service, a thought of love to the great source of all. So she called the Holy Spirit the Father's life. Page 21. Notice what she said on page 166. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still by his Spirit, the minister of the church on earth. He, that is Christ, is withdrawn from the eye of sense, but his parting promise is, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. While he delegates his power to inferior ministers, his energizing presence is still with his church. It's Jesus himself. It's the same book, by the way. Let's keep reading. Page 234. The Savior had spoken through all the prophets. The Spirit of Christ, which was in them, testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ. So the Holy Spirit that was in the prophets of old is the Spirit of Christ. Right? Page 805. The Holy Spirit is the breath of the spiritual life in the soul. The impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. It imbues the receiver with the attributes of Christ. So in the same book, She's telling you the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ. On page 827, Christ gives them the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. The Holy Spirit puts forth its highest energies and so forth. So in the same book, she's telling you it is the life of his own life. It is his spirit. It's his personal presence. Why ignore what she said in the first part of the book and the second part of the book and just take one sentence out of an 800-something page book and build a doctrine on it. It doesn't make sense. Read the whole book. Understand what she's saying. That is why she can say in the same book, on page 324, the only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith. And on page 621, she says, sin could be resisted or overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. So which, how many onlys is there? Right? Only is talking about one thing. She said it's only through the indwelling of Christ and only through the third person of the Godhead. Why did she say that? Because the third person of the Godhead is the spirit of Christ. She's saying the same thing in different words. That's all what it is. That's not a trinity teaching or a doctrine. Amen? Now, the, the, I won't have time to go on the statement that say that the Holy Spirit is as much a person as God is a person and the Holy Spirit is walking on these grounds and so forth because it's all the same principle. None of us in here denies the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person. We all believe that. The problem is, is it the person of Christ or is it another person different than Christ? So, I won't go on these statements <laughs> because they're the same. What about the other statement, the heavenly trio? Let's have a look at it. It says, The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight. The Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifested. The Word of God declares Him to be the express image of His person. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here is shown the personality of the Father. She goes on to say, The Comforter that Christ promised to send after He ascended to heaven is the Spirit in all the fullness of of the Godhead, making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. And then she made this statement. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient and so forth. Now somebody reads this statement and says, surely that's a Trinitarian statement, right? She says, heavenly trio. What more do you want? Oh, hang on a second. What does three you mean? Three. Does anybody here in this hall, any of you does not believe that there is a Father, there is a Son, and there is a Holy Spirit? So you believe in three. So you believe in a heavenly trio. But what does she mean by the statement? Let us analyze it. The first part. The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight. All what she's saying is the Father is all the fullness of divinity, but he's invisible to the human race. You cannot see him, right? Is there a problem with that? No problem. 
The Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifested. Jesus is all the fullness of divinity, but manifested, revealed to us. The Word of God declares Him the express image of His person. He's the express image of His Father. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It's His Son. Why? Here is shown the personality of the Father. So all what it's saying is, the Father is all the fullness of divinity, but you can't see Him. The Son is all the fullness of divinity, but it's manifested to you. Right? So no problem. Then she says, the Comforter that Christ promised to send after He ascended to heaven is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest. So the Spirit is sent in all the fullness of the Godhead. She's not saying the Father is all the fullness, the Son is all the fullness, the Spirit is all the fullness. No, no, no. Father is, the Son is, the Spirit is sent in all the fullness of the Godhead. But nonetheless, somebody say, oh, you're splitting hers. And, okay, let, let us just look at it a bit deeper. What is the statement saying? The Comforter, the Christ promised to send after He ascended to heaven, right? So the Comforter, or this third person, is the one that Christ sent after He ascended to heaven, right? Does she talk anywhere else in her writing about who Christ sent after he ascended to heaven? Ask her. This is out of ages. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still by his spirit, the minister of the church on earth. He is withdrawn. We just read this, right? So that's Christ. She says, we want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ. She said the Holy Spirit is himself. She said... Christ gives them the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. The comforter is the Holy Spirit, the soul of his life. Christ gives them the life of his life. Did she say what she meant? Who is the comforter? She did. She said the comforter is the one that Christ sent after he went to heaven. And she told you in her other writings what she meant by that. So what's the big deal? We all believe in a father. We all believe in a son. We all believe in a spirit. Just what do our words mean? So when Ellen White said the comforter that Christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the spirit in all the fullness of the God, she meant or she was talking about the, his spirit or the life or the presence of Christ. She was talking about Christ himself in spirit form. She made that very clear elsewhere in her writing. Right? And when she said there are three living persons of the heavenly trio in the name of these three great powers, we all believe there is a Father, a Son, and there is a Holy Spirit. Nobody denies that. If you deny that, you do not read the scriptures. The Bible is very clear. All it means is, as she said somewhere else in 1905, they have one God, one Savior, and one Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is to bring them, to bring unity into their ranks. So this is the heavenly tree she's talking about. One God, one Savior, and one Spirit. It's the Spirit of Christ. This is the heavenly tree she's talking about. It's not a Trinitarian statement. You with me? All right. Now, again, this deals with the other statements, the three great powers and three heavenly dignitaries. They're all the same point. We all believe in three. Just who they are, their identity is made very clear in her writings. So I won't deal with them because they're covered. What about the statement that we read about earlier? In Christ is life original, unborrowed, underived. He that has the Son has life. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. Honestly, I've never understood what the problem with this statement is, but for other people's sake, we'll have a look at it in context. Here is the context. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It is not physical life that is here specified, but immortality, the life which is exclusively the property of God. The word who was with God and who was God had this life. Physical life is something which each individual receives. It is not eternal or immortal, for God, the life giver, takes it again. Man has no control over his life, but the life of Christ was unborrowed. Can you notice the contrast she's making here? Man does not have control over his life, but Christ's life is unborrowed. Christ has control over his life. That's what she's saying, right? Keep reading. No one can take this life from him. I lay it down myself, he said. In him was life original, unborrowed, and derived. This life is not inherent in man. He can possess it only through Christ. He cannot earn it. It is given him as a free gift. Oh, so this life, original, unborn, and derived, can be given, right? So what's the big deal? The Bible says it was given to Christ. What's the big deal? It's the type of life. 
This life was given to, can be given to man and it has been given to Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 5 verse 26, As the Father had life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. And why is it called original, unborn, and derived? It's the type of life that it is, the same life that the Father had. It's an original, unborn, and derived life. What is the problem with that statement? I don't, I, I don't know. But I thought to mention it because it's a problem for others. Notice what we read in Desire of Ages. All things Christ received from God, but he took to give. So then heavenly courts in his ministry for all created beings through the Son, the Father's life. So Christ received all things from the Father, and it is the Father's life that flows through Christ. It's an original, unborrowed, underived life. That's all what she's saying. It's not a Trinitarian statement. <laughs> what about pre-existent, self-existent? Notice what she said. Christ is the pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. In speaking of His pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. He assures us, assures us that there never was a time when He was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. He to whose voice the Jews were then listening had been with God as one brought up with Him. So to many, this is a problem. She says, He's pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. There you go. He's God the Son. Well, hang on a second. Let's look at the context. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? The correspondence between the Jews and Jesus about Abraham. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Christ is the pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. So for a second. The context is about Jews, their conversation with Jesus about Abraham, right? And she's saying he's a pre-existent. Well, let's take it one phrase at a time. Pre-existent. In context here, what's she talking about? Before, before Abraham, before all creation. Christ pre-existed all creation. Do we all believe that? Yes. We saw that according to the historians, the church that was non-Trinitarian believed in the pre-existence of Christ. They admitted that. So what's the problem? He's pre-existent. But, but, but notice, pre-existent what? Self-existent what? God the Son, right? Is that what she says? He's the pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. He pre-existed and self-existed as the Son of God. Don't miss the words. So in that very same statement is evidence for what we believe. He pre-existed as the Son of God. Not God the Son. And then in that context, she quotes Micah chapter 5, verse 2, where it says, whose goings forth, or if you look it up in Hebrew, it means whose family descent, right? We'll come back to self-existent. Uh, but the statement goes on to say, through Solomon, Christ declared, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting. I was brought forth. I was brought forth. I was by him. What's that? That's Proverbs 8, right? We saw that earlier. So she's saying he's a pre-existent, self-existent son of God, and she's giving the biblical evidence for that. The biblical evidence is found in Proverbs chapter 8, where Jesus said, I was brought forth before creation. That's what she's saying. So what's the problem? Oh, self-existent. Well, didn't we see earlier that he received the same life that the father had? Isn't the father's life self-existent? As the Father had life in Himself, so has He given to Christ to have life in Himself. He's self-existent. It doesn't mean He's God the Son. It simply means He has the life that the Father gave Him. The very same life that the Father has. It's all what it is. That's all what it is. And then the statement goes on to say, In speaking of His pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. He assures us that there never was a time when He was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. There you go. Somebody say, there you go. Jesus existed as long as God existed. That's not true. That's not what she's saying. It's like saying, there was never a time when Eve was not in close communion or fellowship with Adam. Is that statement true? As long as Eve existed, she was in close fellowship with Adam. And Jesus, since the time of his big getting in the days of eternity, he's been in close fellowship with the Father. As a matter of fact, she said another statement Similar to that effect earlier in Patriarchs and Prophets, one, according to the church, the whole church was non-Trinitarian. 
Notice what she said. Christ was the Son of God. He had been one with Him before the angels were called into existence. He had ever stood at the right hand of the Father. He was ever in close communion with the Father. That's what she's saying. Exact same thing as the statement that we read earlier. Just different words. So, as far as I can see, there is no problem. One more objection and we'll finish with that. Christ and the Spirit intercede. And here is the statement. Christ, our mediator, and the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding in man's behalf, but the Spirit pleads not for us as does Christ, who presents his blood shed from the foundation of the world. The Spirit works upon our hearts, drawing out prayers and penitence, praise and thanksgiving, and so forth. So the objection is brought forth that there you go, we have two intercessors. Christ is interceding and the Holy Spirit is interceding. That proves that there is God, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, hang on a second. Is this what she meant? Did she mean there are two intercessors? First of all, is this what the Bible says? For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The Bible says there's only one. Ellen White says the same thing. She's in harmony with the Bible, not the other way around, by the way. Right? She's in harmony with the Bible. The mightiest created intellect cannot comprehend God. Words from the most eloquent tongue fail to describe him. Men have only one advocate, one intercessor, who is able to pardon transgressions. Let her explain her own statement. She believed there is only one intercessor, it's Jesus Christ. So that statement before, what she meant by it, is that as Christ is interceding in his physical form before the Father in heaven, he is by his spirit interceding or working on the hearts of his people on earth. Didn't we read something similar in Desire of Ages? Let, let's read it in the greater context of Desire of Ages 166, and we, this will be our last statement. She says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Though the ministration was to be removed from the earthly to the heavenly temple, though the sanctuary and our great high priest would be invisible to human sight, yet the disciples were to suffer no loss thereby. They would realize no break in their communion and no diminution sorry, of power because of the Savior's absence. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still by his spirit, the minister of the church on earth. He is withdrawn from the eye of sense, but his parting promise is fulfilled. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. So who is the intercessor? Whoever lives to make intercession? It is Christ. He, is the, he intercedes before God in his physical form, and it is himself, by his spirit, by his own life, that is interceding on the hearts of his people on earth. That's what the statement means. It's not a Trinitarian statement. So, <laughs> was Alan Watt a Trinitarian? No. no. Alan Watt was not a Trinitarian. Alan Watt did not change. Alan Watt maintained the same belief that she had in the beginning up till the year she died. So I hope for those Seventh-day Adventists who are holding to the spirit of prophecy, to Alan White, more than they are holding to the Bible, I just want to show them that even that, they don't have to hold. In and of itself, that is wrong to do. To put the spirit of prophecy on top of the Bible, that is wrong to do. But if you're doing that and you think the spirit of prophecy lends weight to the Trinity, I just want to show you that's wrong. Amen? All right, let us close with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, with all our hearts for your spirit that guides and leads us into all truth. We thank you, Father, for uh, the time we have to fellowship together, to study your word, and now as we took some time to look at the writings of Ellen White, I pray, dear Lord, that you'll use this message for your own glory in the lives of those who need to hear. This is my prayer in Jesus' name.